I just wanted to welcome our friends, um, Marcel Emery, who's joining us from sunny Miami. Um, you've got Bridget Bauman, who is joining us from Zurich in Switzerland. And my good friend, Nick Hill, who's joining us by the River Thames and Barnes in London. So welcome uh, all of you. And thank you for joining us um, on, this, on this workshop, uh, which we're all part of, uh, Marcel and I are part of uh, a business called JTC Group. Uh, we are a listed business on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, we are a professional services business uh, dealing with private business families across the globe in terms of their personal planning um, and as well as corporate and institutional uh, clients who require structuring for their uh, businesses, who require structuring and fund work for their joint venture vehicles. Um, we're based in Jersey in the Channel Islands, uh, the beautiful islands that are just off the coast of France. Um, and we ourselves, uh, as JTC as a business, we are across 20 different jurisdictions from Europe uh, to the Caribbean, uh, through US, uh, in a, um, also through Asia and Singapore, and in places like Mauritius and Dubai. So we, we are essentially administrators of structures. And um, and through through our interaction with and thanks to uh, my good friend uh, Tariq El Kadi who leads Techni, um, he has kindly sort of uh, we've kindly worked with his business angels communities over the years, and it's given us a good opportunity to to partake in this uh, workshop. Um, our focus on this workshop really is. Um, uh, the question really is how do you structure our, our sort of incubators, accelerators, uh, venture capital and advisors helping um, founders uh, understand why the corporate and tax structuring of their startups is important to raise capital, to scale up and to exit and protect uh, their, the wealth that is then gradually built up. And I know um, that recently, a few months ago, we were in, uh, Nick and I were in Lagos in Nigeria, where we came across the next level of founders that had already scoped up their businesses and were then looking to access capital markets to, to, to increase their next uh, series fundraising. So that, that was quite, a, quite an interesting uh, people came across and something that Nick can touch upon. Um, Bridget is, um, guides a lot of... Uh, uh, she's an entrepreneur herself, a, a good, maybe a serial entrepreneur uh, in, in this whole ecosystem. And uh, she also guides family offices, in particular, the next generation in terms of um, uh, sort of almost weaning them into understanding and investing into sort of startup projects for the families, uh, additional investments that they do. And Marcel, my colleague, is an advocate. Um, he's um, quite clued up on and um, or with the business angels communities in North America and in particular Latin America, where he travels extensively. Um, and it will be good to get a perspective uh, from from the Americas from uh, what Marcel has been doing. So I thought maybe we'll just start off our conversation. Um, around maybe start a little bit on Marcel, perhaps a little bit on to do with the structuring um, in terms of how you got to think about it to begin with and um, how do you deal with it on a layer by layer basis. Well, Samesh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you, Techni, for making this virtual space uh, um, um, happen uh, because. Um, as I always explain, each time I'm invited to participate in this uh, type of event, it's, uh, for me, it's very important and I love it because it's, the, it's a great opportunity to share experience, uh, a great opportunity to learn from uh, experts in the, in the field and people that are passionate about venturing and entrepreneurship. And, and I'm sure that the conversation that we'll have today in this virtual room it's going to be very interesting for all of us as panel speakers of this uh, meetup, and also uh, to all the people that are watching this content live and that will probably watch this content at a later date because we understand that this content is being recorded. 
So one of the interesting things I would like to share with all of you is that as Silesh was explaining, I've been doing a lot of traveling uh, in Latin America and on those business development uh, uh, meetings, I, I have been able to <clears throat> interact not only with entrepreneurs, but also with fund managers uh, from, uh, I'm also, I have also interacted with angel investors uh, I have also interacted with accelerators and the most important Latin American entrepreneurship and venturing um, associations. And one of the things that has uh, called my attention is that none of them are uh, explaining to successful entrepreneurs why it is so important to set up the correct corporate and tax structures uh, when they start or kick off their, their businesses. Um, and and um, for me, that's, that's some, that was a, a big surprise uh, because if you do not take care of that, is, the, that is specific uh, subject matter when you're launching your startup, that could um, consume substantial time and will cost you cost probably a lot of money uh, when you're in the process of raising capital or uh, eventually scaling your business or actually selling your business because not having the correct structure <clears throat> could um, uh, make it difficult to raise capital because uh, local investors um, and international investors don't like to invest in, 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 in local entities, but uh, ho international holding entities. Uh, and could be a problem as well when you're scaling the business because you don't have access to certain <clears throat> uh, protections and benefits that are available in double taxation treaties. And you will probably also have, uh, um, will not be able to save taxes when you decide to sell. And there are some horror stories where, you know, entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs have sold their businesses and they end up uh, leaving on the table a, a large sum of, of, of the purchase price uh, because the, the correct structure was not set up in uh, originally. Uh, and of course, you know, nobody, <laughs> very few people are explaining uh, to successful entrepreneurs how to protect the wealth that they make when they sell the business and how to plan how that wealth is going to, wealth is going to be transferred to the next generation in a tax and a very efficient and orderly way. And, and that's why we have decided to create awareness about this specific topic, uh, sharing our experience with entrepreneurs, angel investors, VCs, Latin American venture and, and, and um, entrepreneurship asso associations. Yeah, no, thank you, Marcel. Uh, Bridget, I'm gonna just draw you in on, um, Obviously, you, you're an investor as well as an advisor to many, many sort of the startup um, ecosystem um, in terms of, um, you know, cap rays and so forth. What are your, what, what's your experience regarding that and how are you seeing things? I mean, both from a domestic and of course, cap rays can come from domestic sources as well as, of course, international uh, or a, a blend of the two. Yeah, so um, building on what Marcel said it's true we don't discuss it more much and probably uh we we should the usually i i see things in kind of three buckets first is deciding where the corporation will be um and and for many companies um, depending on where they are for example in switzerland usually the the startups they create a company in switzerland and the the main company stays in Switzerland and as they go abroad, they will do subsidiaries. Uh, where it gets, so that one, where it gets more tricky is <laughs> countries and in, indeed where the ecosystem is very much still in development and the market risks um, and, and the conditions for investors are not very clear or not very stable, in which case it's true that very early on, the entrepreneurs need to think, okay, for example, we do a lot of work in the West Balkans and Georgia and countries, uh, Pakistan, things like this, where the entrepreneurs start there, but at some point it's okay, if I'm gonna be bringing investors, um, what will investors, what will make me attractive for investors? Um, so that's still on the corporate side. Now, many of these companies, the challenge becomes, because I'm also on the EU, on the jury of, of the uh, EIC incubator, where we 
invest in startups. Um, there's always discussion, okay, where's really the company if we're going to be giving millions in the company, but really they're now already in the US for investor sake. So there's considerations from a business point of view. So that's category number, number two, where definitely as investors and as entrepreneurs, we need to get much more educated is ourselves. How do we, how are we as shareholders in those companies? And depending on where we live, where we work, where are going to be the considerations when there's the exit of the company? The third one where I focus a lot on is as an entrepreneur, how do you structure the investors on your shareholder uh, list or cap table? Because if you have many of them, and also depending from where, it can be very complex. And syndicating investors can make a lot of a uh, lot of sense. So those are the three um, considerations that I that I have. Good note. Thank you, Bridget. Nick, I'll, I'll draw you in because you you are of course you just you ex Citibank uh, as well, and you've now obviously with Q Ventures, uh, a business which is a, almost like a VC investor into into businesses and you're looking at obviously you are some of the also looking at exits as well as well as you know sourcing new investors as well so perhaps just give us a bit of background on q ventures and um you know the sort of activities you're seeing what sort of things you are anticipating in terms of your your book going forward yeah thanks sir. it's been a pleasure to be here and and, and actually, uh, a lot of what we do is, to Bridges' point, is, 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 is to an extent, uh, in my new role at Q Ventures, is syndicating, uh, you know, investors on the cap table. So primarily, uh, just for background in the new role, um, what we're essentially doing is within the UK and the European, and even more so now in the Middle East and the African um, uh, tech space, is we're essentially building um, portfolios of private companies for on the behalf of cashed out entrepreneurs and family officers, right? Um, but in that sense, it simplifies the cap table for investors and also allows us to uh, use our expertise to manage those portfolios on the behalf of those individuals. Um, but also, as you know, from our time, and I think I'll just uh, labor the point that's already been made, which is from our time, from my time at City previously, uh, I was private banker at City covering the emerging market space, mainly in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, and as you know, Salish, we worked on many, uh, many clients uh, where essentially we're wealth managers and hoping to manage exits of uh, successful entrepreneurs. But you need to be involved very early with those entrepreneurs in order to have a relationship, in order to actually add that value and be worthy of, uh, of such a role at the end when the liquidity does come. And uh, as you know from our past, but I think it's important for the audience is that one of the ways that we realized the most important thing that a founder um, should be focused on from the founder's point of view at series a series b is right you've proven the concept you're now you know you're now building significant revenue and now you need to think how am i holding these shares and how is it and i think the key thing is if there's anyone in the audience who um for example if, if it is middle east if you have a u.s touch point it's incredibly important we've had many founders who uh you know could only put 12 million dollars into a structure uh, and they built billion dollar positions um, and at that point, they could only put that $12 million into, uh, into a structure, whereas if they had structured a Series A, they could have put their $12 million in and grew it to a billion dollars, and, and you've got a billion dollars in the structure rather than that, rather than your $12 million, the way the, the vice versa. And we saw a lot of that with the US touch points that we do see uh, on the African continent and to an extent into the Middle East. Um, and so, yeah, so, so and so now my sort of segue was that uh, putting the investor's hat back on is that once you've had the exit, whether you're a founder or my new role as an investor, uh, you're now looking to reallocate that capital to preserve it now that you've made your X, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars potentially. And, uh, and we found a city that a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of family offices uh, and a growing trend at the moment is moving into private capital markets rather than public capital markets. And so, you know, I would sit down and say, if you have 100% of investable assets, uh, let's this is your asset allocation. And most investors would say that's fine, but take 10 to 15, maybe even 20% off of that table. Uh, and I want to put it into the private markets. So hence the move to Key Ventures and what we're doing there. 
Okay. Thank you, Nicholas. And I mean, Marcel, you know, your experience with, because you're dealing with a whole host of different range of uh, North American and Latin American businesses. How are you seeing the, how are they sort of approaching the cap raise and also the structuring around that? Yeah, it's a <clears throat> very important question. You know, um, when I have the opportunity to interact with successful entrepreneurs uh, in Latin America, and when I talk about structuring, uh, which is something that I do often participating in these type of events and on a podcast that I have uh, every Friday at say 7 a.m., I normally suggest uh, to uh, the, the, the co-founders are uh, at an early stage that uh, they should budget uh, when um, defining how much money they need to uh, put in motion their business, uh, the amount of money that is going to be necessary to set up the correct structure from day one. Because so one of the things that happens normally is that at least in Latin America, Latin American entrepreneurs are no longer setting up companies to do business locally and solve pain points of, of the local jurisdiction where the startup is being born. They always uh, are, you know, think about that they, 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 they detect the opportunity and they work and build a product, okay, um, to solve that solution and take a, they address the opportunity, uh, not, lo not only locally, but regionally or even globally. So I'm always explaining to them that it's very important to have the, the necessary money not to cover, just to cover the operations of the business, but also to set up the correct structure. Because if you start with a local company, uh, you'll probably be able and be successful raising capital from friends and family. But when you start conversations with sophisticated angel, angel investors and VCs, because you need additional um, funds in order to scale your business, you will soon realize as an entrepreneur uh, that uh, they will not feel comfortable uh, investing in a local entity. Uh, and, and if the correct international structure is not set up from day one, then uh, you need to retain the services of an attorney to implement something that locally is called a flip. And that flip has tax consequences and those tax consequences could be substantial. And that means that um, without actually um, uh, selling the business, but restructuring the business, the co-founders and the early investors may be required to pay local taxes just because they decide to reorganize the ownership of the business flipping the ownership to an international structure. And that's something that can be avoided from day one. Uh, so having the correct structure or the correct international corporate and tax structure from day one, basically in summary, uh, achieves two very important goal. First of all, it will make the, 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 uh, the investment in the startup more appealing and attractive to angel investors and VCs. And second of all, it will avoid, it will avoid the tax adverse tax consequences of implementing a, a flip to transfer the ownership uh, from the local investors over to an international corporate structure, uh, which is something that can be, can be resolved very simply with the correct structures. And from JTC, at JTC, we're offering like options like the something that we call the startup uh, sandwich, which is a Cayman company with an underlying subs uh, subsidiary, which normally is a US LLC from which uh, we uh, ha hang uh, the, the, op the shares of the subsidiaries, which are the operating companies in Latin America. Okay. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, Bridget, you know, I mean, you obviously advise a number of uh, different sort of uh, businesses as well. What, what's your experience uh, sitting from Zurich? Yeah. Um, the big, big thing for us, and the kind of investments I make are tech companies. Um, kind of from zero to maybe we'll have some revenues when they get acquired five to seven years later from Apple, Cisco, those kind of global corporates um, and um, and so and quite deep tech. And the the thing is that's always a challenge is how do we manage what Marcel has said with the fact that many of those companies will have at least half of their financing come from non-dilutive, types of financing. 
And those often come with a number of conditions. So that's, that's the, the piece that now, at least in most countries where, where I invest and where I have clients with whom we invest, there is um, now people get it that you should start right away with a structure where you're going to be able to bring a number of investors because um, and, and, and get quite big, even though if it's more expensive. And many countries have understood that even within those structures, you have if you're really small, you don't have to yet do an audit. So all the reasons of why entrepreneurs were not doing it and then having the challenge that Marcel was saying, in some countries that's starting, at least they start with the correct. The big challenge is how do you bring the non-dilutive money that often has public money attached to it and where they will only put that money in, in locations where they feel where, and you can prove also as a business, not only you have the legal structure, but you have the team behind um, locally uh, matched with where the money's coming from. So we, we fully, the, the challenge we're facing is, is a little bit, the how do we balance what Marcel had said? It'd be great to hear Marcel's point of view and the very attractive non-dilutive money that's often accessible to deep tech companies. I think the key, key um, what we've experienced since uh dealing with sort of investor vehicles is that a lot of them want to be in better quality jurisdictions. So in slightly tax neutral jurisdictions so that there's no leakage in the, in the actual investor vehicle itself uh, within, within their structuring. And that then attracts slightly bigger uh, sort of family offices, uh, slightly more institutional money that comes in. There's very clear clarity in terms of the corporate governance of that of that vehicle, which can manage conflicts of interest as well. Sometimes promoters and investor interest uh, uh, sometimes can can have conflicts. Um, and I think by by having the right sort of uh, service providers and right structuring in the in the in the better regulated jurisdictions um, is what we are starting to see now in terms of because I mean if you look at you know, groups like Mediterranean Business Angels and other angel groups, of course, in North America, it's a lot of them in co-invest into, into so, they, so they sort of collect money in this vehicle from the different angels groups, and then they co-invest in each other's uh, structures uh, and start up ecosystems in their own countries. So that is what we're starting to see. There's, there's a collective movement, if you like, in terms of um, uh, structuring now that's taking place. Mm -hmm. and, and that also then lines you up slightly, aligns slightly better when it comes to then further capital raise, also an exit eventually in terms of the new buyers coming in, um, there's proper valuations and proper governance structures yeah. and so forth. So that's increasingly what we're seeing in terms of the demand for the type of services JTC are doing. Um, yeah. One of the things okay, that I want to add, uh, Sailesh, is that uh, yeah. this is not only this, the correct structuring is not only relevant for to co-founders and, and friends and family uh, who are the early investors in any startups. This is something that is very relevant as well for fund managers uh, and VCs. Uh, Absolutely. And, and I was questioning myself whether they, they, you know, fund managers have the fiduciary duty or not to review the corporate structure of the startups that are part of their portfolio. Because when you think about the, uh, the goal of a fan, fund manager and the purpose, purpose of any VC fund is to multiply 5X, 10X, 20X, 100X, the investments that they receive from LPs. So if they fail to uh, do like an X-ray of the co corporate structures of the uh, startups that are part of their portfolio, uh, for some reason, some of them don't have the correct structure and, uh, or the ideal uh, uh, structure um, uh, for an exit to, uh, uh, and I'm referring, you know, the, the correct structure to save taxes when the company is sold, um, then the, the, the returns that the VC will offer to its investors could be substantially reduced uh, because of the impact of, of income taxes when the businesses are sold uh, or the startups are sold by the uh, co-founders and you know the investors of the company. 
So that's, in my opinion, this is something relevant, not only for uh, founders and, you know, very early investors, but also very relevant for sophisticated angel investors and VCs. Yeah. Uh, Nick, you were going to come in, sorry. Yeah. yeah, sorry, if I could just add on that, maybe just like as a case study, for example, you know, with, uh, like I say, I'm talking from a, typically, uh, I would say the majority of our business at Q Ventures, where we put uh, family offices and cash down entrepreneurs uh, and build portfolios of private companies on their behalf, minimum $10 million, just for context, is that typically uh, it used to be a UK and European business from the point of view of the companies that we're investing in. And as a result, most of the investor base, uh, historically, if we say before, you know, previously to the last 18 months came from the same jurisdictions. Now we're seeing with what's happening in the macro environment with the pound uh, and the strength of the dollar, et cetera, as well as the market now being priced, you can argue, uh, and I'm sure there's more of that to come, we're seeing a lot more of the investor base coming from uh, from dollar-based communities, whether it's the US or whether it's the Middle East or, or Africa. And as a result, we've just had to go through a big restructuring from our point of view so that we're custodizing those investments in jurisdictions that, to your point, are tax neutral for those investors to hold those investors in, in order that our business model is attractive to receive that institutional capital to deploy it into those companies. So I just wanted to uh, to kind of put some color on that because I think it, it's incredibly true. And maybe if I can add on what Nick said, one of the things both as an investor as an entrepreneur that's become a challenge is again, as we're looking to optimize what Marcel was talking about is getting bank accounts. Um, nowadays, especially when they say, okay, who who's behind it? And as soon as you have a certain percentage Anytime there's anything new that happens in the company, not only is it the directors, but also it's being asked a lot of data on the UB, the ultimate beneficial owners. That's adding a level of complexity and finding banks who understand <laughs> that in startups, especially with the mix now of shareholders you have and how you're born global and depending on where you're going to be, you're going to you're, you're going to need to think about what's best for the company, but also what's best for the shareholders, especially the founders, um, and the employee stock option plan, which is a whole other thing that has also tax con considerations. We're, we've been really struggling, myself, other entrepreneurs and, and investors, who are the banking institutions who understand it and, and who say they support entrepreneurship, but actually then, when it comes down to it, we'll work with entrepreneurs that, that have these different um, structures besides just, okay, I'm a Swiss company or a UK company, I have Swiss investors and, and everything's easy and, um, and just maybe one or two subsidiaries in a couple of other countries. So that's, that's a big, big thing that would be great to get financial service organizations also around the table for this kind of discussion. That's at least our current experience. Yeah. Bridget, thank you for bringing, that's pretty much our bread and butter work as JTC, because we're a corporate services provider in you know, the different jurisdictions and we're regulated uh, business. So our relationships with banks and so forth, the bank is looking to us for comfort and and the structures that we look after for founders and for collective sort of uh, vehicles um, it makes it slightly more easier the issues that you've sort of raised and i think marcel you can sort of build on that 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 point yeah <clears throat> one of one of two other things that i would like to mention Silas, <clears throat> is that um um Brigitte, a couple of minutes ago, were, was uh, talking about how important it is to have a clean cap table if you're a startup, okay? Uh, and it's very important when specifically you uh, kick off the challenge of raising uh, capital from sophisticated investors, because when you sit down with a sophisticated angel investor or a VC, one of the uh, documents that you will need to show uh, that potential investor is your cap table. And if you have a cap table with 40 friends who are shareholders or equity holders in, in your startup, 
that's something that um, could uh, trigger the decision of, of the investor to not to invest in, in your startup. So um, it is very important to explain to co-founders that there are ways and, 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 and solutions to avoid um, uh, a dirty cap table when you start the conversations with uh, uh, an angel investor or, or a VC. And one of those options are the SPVs that can be set up uh, and those SPVs will receive all the investments from friends and family. A uh, company like JTC could uh, uh, offer director services to that SPV. Uh, I understand that there are other options uh, such as uh, trust. Uh, we were having the other day uh, a very interesting conversation with Bridget regarding that option uh, as an option to um, consolidate or syndicate a large number of, of small ticket investors, and you will also uh, and, and I, by and by structuring the investment through a trust, uh, the startup will be able to uh, show in its cap table only one investor, and that one investor would be the trustee company. Well, I'll pass the mic over to Brigitte and let their let her explain a little bit more how that wonderful product works because for me it was a surprise mm -hmm. that we could actually use trust to facilitate uh, and, and help uh, uh, co-founders keep a very clean uh, cap table, which is very necessary when you begin conversations with sophisticated VCs and sophisticated angel investors. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, yes. Syndication for, for Go Beyond Vesting, which is one of the largest pan-European US angel communities that, that I've built um, from the beginning, we wanted to invest as groups and, um, and we wanted to have enough money to build a full portfolio and, and have enough to reinvest. But we realized that mean, meant that our typical ticket size would, would bring too many people on the cap table for entrepreneurs. So we've been for the last 12 years syndicating. And um, what, we've, what we've been using is in, it's, it's actually not a structure, is in pretty much every country, there is regulated entities like JTC. In some countries, it can be even a lawyer who can serve as a fiduciary or a trustee. And so basically what happens is that um, the in in investors have a relationship with that trustee. And anytime they make an investment, they send, and it's usually coordinated via an angel network, they send their investment commitment form and sometimes it's five of us, sometimes it's 20 of us, sometimes it can be 30 of us um, to the fiduciary or the trustee. And then the trustee buys the shares on behalf of those individuals, holds the shares on behalf of those individuals. They are, um, and the ultimate beneficial owner stays, so it's totally tax transparent, stays the individuals. Sometimes the entrepreneurs say, could you show us? And it's, you know, it's not to hide, but it's really to facilitate to the entrepreneurs what you've mentioned to have a clean cap table. And since usually that entity does not know all the details about the deal, one of us who's in that syndicate becomes the representative for the business kinds of decisions. But for important decisions like making new investments or selling if there's a time where individuals can decide on an individual basis. People can, again, make decisions on their own. They send their, um, their forms of instructions to the fiduciary. So that indeed, different structure, the UK has used that a lot. Um, and, uh, and we've used it in, in many countries with investors from also many countries. But one has the startups have to look at what works in their jurisdictions. The other thing for some countries that are just beginning and maybe yet they don't know how to use the, the, the structures, uh, we, I would recommend that the entrepreneurs already can start with a simple agreement that from those small investors to add in the shareholder agreement that they sign, that if at some point that maybe they will start direct on the cap table, but that the entrepreneur has the right at some point, if it becomes important for the next round or to prepare for exit, that they will syndicate. That is one of those simple little lines in a shareholder agreement. Like you've, you've given quite a few tips that 
that is kind of a no brainer, but can help so much later on. Because if you ha don't have that, and then you have those 40, 50, 60, and you want to regroup them, it can be a nightmare. So even if you don't do it right away as an entrepreneur, make sure that you put something in there, a provision that you can bring them together um, when the time might require it. And for them, that could be good because instead of each one of them owning 0.1% or something, then together they'll be back to being a decent type of investor, five, 10% owners mm. of the company. So there's advantages and these syndicates, what's fantastic, it can create a secondary market type of opportunity, which a lot of times the early investors are looking after five, seven years, um, then if they can sell, or especially the family and friends who came in and then won't reinvest, it's actually good so they don't become like fools to be able to maybe sell their shares within that small um, uh, small owner uh, kind of category. Absolutely. And Nick, Nick, you know, you're, you have an investor base as well, people are putting, um, how, how have you sort of approached that aspect to uh, Q Ventures? Well, so yeah, so I think at the, at, at the same time, like I say, we're, uh, we're typically, uh, we're typically using Jersey. So the way we're structured at the moment is that Ideally, uh, on average, I would say on any on any one at any one time, we have essentially ten pools of capital uh, that we're seeking to deploy. So uh, let's just call it uh, ten pools of ten million, uh, and then the origination team are obviously going uh, going out and shopping for those deals um, uh, on to put them into the portfolios on a discretionary basis for clients. So on e in each of our structures. It's obviously not, but just to paint a picture, it would typically be uh, we get an opportunity to raise 10 million of capital for company X, and we will deploy, therefore, 1 million from each of the 10 pools of capital uh, into that deal and into that structure and custodize it, uh, most likely in Jersey, uh, on their behalf uh, in a nominee structure. So the investors get a, get a share certificate for 10% of that structure. Uh, it's held, it's managed, uh, it's managed through the the raises that are to come to ensure that uh, that the dilution is minimized and then um, or at least the investors know what they need to top up if they want to uh, and then we manage the exits and then distribute uh, distribute that back to uh, back to the investors um, but one, one thing I thought I'd add actually just given the audience uh, on the call is um, and from from previous experience right is that um, I think, like you say, uh, you're starting in one jurisdiction, typically, as a company uh, within the emerging market space, let's say, uh, given, given, the, uh, given, given the nexus of this call. And I think it's important to find a, to the bank account question earlier, to find a partner that ideally understands your corporate side and your personal side as an individual. Because then if you can marry the two and you can find a partner early, and when I say early, let's talk about maybe Series A, because at that point, you've got a partner who will grow your business. You've got access to that banking network for, for when you're growing outside of your initial jurisdiction. Let's just call it Egypt and you expand into the Middle East or you expand into, uh, into Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you can find that, then if you've got a bank that understands the corporate side and can facilitate the corporate expansion, they're also going to be uh, much more willing and much more able to service you on the personal side as well from international jurisdictions, which can marry with all of the structuring that we've been talking about. Uh, and that's essentially what I was doing at uh, Citibank. And um, even though I've moved on, I left on great terms. So I will just say, uh, you know, that we did have, you know, City is active because it, it, it is genuinely the only global bank that is active across Africa. So it's, it's, it's actually on the ground in 12 countries. And it's got a license in 33. So as a result, if you can find an international partner like that, and typically uh, the headquarters in the UAE are very useful and very willing to bank companies in Africa as well, um, then, then that can be, that can be a, a, a nice kind of platform for expansion as well. Yeah, Nick, thank you. I mean, I know on the personal side, um, the founders now, a lot of them have dilemmas in terms of the value of their stocks that are developing and, and that management and the planning for that. I know, for example, in Nigeria, and Nick and I were there a few months ago and Marcel joined us virtually as well. Uh, we were speaking to founders, which 
they had founded the businesses in let's say 2015 all of a sudden their their individual stock is worth 20 million dollars 40 million or 50 million dollars maybe even 100 million dollars and many of them had structured around delaware companies and then not realizing that perhaps you know uh, Uncle Sam would want, uh, you know, their their piece in terms of any uh, inheritance tax issues that come on. That could be a hit of about forty percent on the value of their investment. And we've now having to sort of uh, help them with their planning with with uh, tax attorneys to make sure that that stock's looked after. And I know Marcel, it's it's something you touched on earlier, but it it is more and more common because, you know, if you look at the there's some world class companies being developed in these regions and these these are quite pioneering businesses um businesses that is almost you know in terms of supply chains in, in terms of cutting out the middleman if you like and and going from if you like the farmer to the consumer direct uh be using tech and fintech um in in that process and i think a lot of entrepreneurs have have just grown their business phenomenally, but now have this personal issue uh, that that all of a sudden they were worth nothing in 2015, and today, irrespective of the economic environment, their their net worth is is is, is immense. And now they've got succession issues coming through, where money comes in, then a whole lot of infrastructure comes with that at the personal level, and and Marcel, uh, you know, we of course, you know. Uh, deal with that but uh, what are your thoughts on that in terms of the wealth management wealth planning side at a personal level for these founders yeah before i, I answer your question Silesh, I, i'm gonna highlight you know uh two two ideas uh, now that you're sharing uh, our experience uh, talking to very successful african entrepreneurs in nigeria in this event where we participated with nick and the and endeavor uh, for me, uh, as and I'm sure it was the same case in your case and Nick's case, uh, I was surprised to learn that they, that most of the entrepreneurs that were participating in that event, uh, which are very successful African entrepreneurs, are part of the Endeavor Network, even though they were not doing nor planning to do business in the U.S., um, had made the decision to set up their holding company here in the U.S. And, and instead of using an LLC, which is a pass-through entity that is not a taxpayer in the U.S., uh, they were advised to set up a C-Corp in, in the U.S. Uh, that could probably make a lot of sense uh, if you are an African or a Latin American entrepreneur uh, raising capital here in the U.S. and you begin conversation with a high profile BC that conditions the disbursement of the investment that uh, to actually previously you setting up a C Corp, okay? Uh, in that case, it makes sense. But is, if, it, if, is, if that's not the case and you don't have plans to do business in the US, open an office in the US, uh, invoice in, in the US or have personnel in the US, Setting up a holding company in the U.S. could um, be very inconvenient. Okay, and one of the interesting things that um, uh, that I've been able to um, conclude after doing a little bit of research, because I love to be very curious, is that the media that uh, talks about uh, entrepreneurship and and venturing always highlights uh, the good news. Uh, they don't share the bad news or the bad experiences of VC funds and entrepreneurs. So uh, there is a lack of information of um, um, horror stories on, on, on the internet that could be useful for entrepreneurs to learn and, uh, and, and to avoid making the same mistakes that, that you know, other entrepreneurs have made in the past. Uh, and this is something that for some reason is not taught, taught at the most sophisticated uh, uh, business school or MBAs uh, around the world. This is something that you learn by practice. But uh, being very, very curious, I was able to find a very interesting article that was published uh, in, in, by Pac Law, which is a, a, U, a US Miami law firm, which is an article or a blog that was written by Nathan Lustig from Magna Partners. And in that blog, he shares with the authorization of the entrepreneur 
who is Brian Reckworth, co-founder of Viva Real, a horror story that he lived uh, a number of years ago when he decided to put in motion, even though he was an, uh, a US uh, citizen, a company in, the, uh, in Brazil, and he made the mistake of setting up a C Corp in here in the US. And at some point in time, a very important Brazilian company became very interested in acquiring his business. And I'm referring to OLX and negotiations started. And um, the end result was that the Brazilian company was not interested in buying the shares of the C Corp here in the US, which, which would have been ideal for many of the investors because there were non-US tax residents and capital gains are not subject to tax in the US, but rather the acquirer made the decision to buy the shares of the underlying operating companies in Brazil and I understand in other jurisdictions and that triggered a capital gain in the hands of the C Corp, which was a US tax player uh, with no offices nor businesses in the US. And that the wrong corporate structure meant that the uh, co-founders and the investors had to pay to Uncle Sam one, $100 million that could, be, could have been saved should the uh, startup um, had the correct structure, considering that it, that, that it had no plans to do business in the US. So, so that's something that I wanted to share because I think it's something that entrepreneurs should be uh, reading and understanding because it's key um, for the success in, in case of, of, of an exit. And as I mentioned before, I think this is something very relevant as well for venture capital firms. Okay, thank you, Massa. So, We're just coming into our Q4 of our uh, of our slot, uh, workshop slot. I just wanted to give you an opportunity, uh, Nick and uh, Bridget, uh, to just to tell us a little bit more about uh, your activities, how you see your businesses going, uh, looking ahead a little bit. So for Q Ventures, uh, Nick, how, how do you see the positioning of uh, Q Ventures and the sort of your activity uh, going forward? Yeah, sure. Thanks. And, and appreciate uh, coming next, because just, 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 just to segue in from what Marcel was saying as well, in terms of access to capital, right? So very aware that a lot of, uh, a, a lot of people in the room and a lot of people uh, on the call uh, you know, if you're founders, obviously the US is a very attractive place to go and raise capital. Um, and obviously you do think that you need to go to the US to raise capital. Um, just for an example at Key Ventures, right, we're a UK based company generally covering the UK and Europe. Um, but given the macro environment, as I mentioned before, with the, you know, the, uh, the weakness, should we say, in the pound in the short term, and the strength of the dollar and the market being priced, we are seeing a lot of you know, my personal client base, which is in the US, it, choosing to invest into these companies. Um, but they, but, but all, all that they're doing is, you know, they're investing into a jersey structure, which will be segregated between the UK, or should we say the US and the non US investors. Um, and they get a clean, uh, they, get, they get a clean structure uh, to, to hold those investments within. So you don't necessarily need to, as Marcel was saying, uh, be in the US, if it doesn't make sense, you can access US capital without those structure, without actually a physical presence in the US. Um, going forward, like I was saying, I think it's a very interesting time um, for the UK and the European space, but to make it more topical, uh, what's interesting for us is, uh, if you bear with me just for two secs, is uh, we'll sit down with, say, a cashed out entrepreneur at the moment, uh, say US based, but build the business out of Nigeria, Pan-Africa, FinTech, and we'll say, hey, we'll build you, you know, this portfolio of assets uh, in the private company space. And uh, he or she will say, yeah, that's great. Uh, but, you know, but I want to choose the fintechs. And so as a result, uh, that choice will not be UK and Europe. And it will typically be uh, a Pan-African or Nigerian or Kenyan or, or Egyptian company that they're going to choose because that's where uh, this digitization and the growth is coming from. And I think that is, that is, that is a trend that we see whether you're in the, Euro, in the UK or you're, you're a European investor or US investor, you know, Africa is firmly on the cards and the Middle East as this area where you're getting that exponential growth. So uh, I can see us doing a lot more work in the space uh, going forward. Okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, Bridget, uh, just give us your perspective and your experience in terms of how you're seeing things uh, evolve now. Sure. Um, actually, three years ago, 
I, um, I, with some other partners of Go Beyond Vesting, did a spin out and we're now dedicated on helping build early stage investing ecosystems in many countries. And the first thing that um, we do is we have been talking a lot about making sure that you can syndicate investors, both for people who want to become investors, um, showing them how it can be a powerful way for them to build nice portfolios, even when they make uh, deal by deal decisions, uh, but, but with a budget that is not maybe in the millions of um, dollars, and uh, which is often what you might need to, to have that as a business angel, and for the entrepreneurs to have a clean cap table. One of the things that we'll definitely be adding uh, more, and that's why I'm delighted to get to know more and more about JTC, is the points that you've made, because some of the things we don't definitely, as in, both as investors and entrepreneurs, probably don't think about it early uh, enough. What for, for us, what is absolutely wonderful, and here as we're the Techno Summit, is to see indeed um, these amazing ecosystems being built all slightly different, all with some common challenges from around the world. Um, but one of them really including that more and more people are daring to put more money into this high risk, early stage investing financing um, sector. But it is an asset class at Go Beyond. We have 10 years plus of data that shows that angel investors can build portfolios that have good returns. And at the same time, seeing that entrepreneurs who cash out naturally go back to investing in the next um, generation of entrepreneurs. So we're going to continue being right there, just like JTC, to support um, and Nick's company to support both the entrepreneurs and investors, especially the new generation of investors, because many countries, they're leading the way. The older generation it's too nerve. It's too scary for them to to do investments in startups. They prefer to continue in things that they know better, like real estate. But the new generation is embracing it, and we want to make sure we're right there and there to maximize their chances of success um, in in this amazing um, space. Thank you, Bridget. That's uh, very inspiring, um, Marcel. You know, before I summarize, uh, uh, perhaps some power tips from you and see see what sort of salient points we take away <clears throat> yeah i completely agree with bridget uh, i think the future of uh, <clears throat> entrepreneurship and venturing not only in the americas but globally it's it's uh, amazing it's uh, it's bright it's a bright future and when you analyze the opportunity at least in at the Amer at in america looking at the numbers i was um, recently reading a report that was published by lafca which is the Latin American Association of Venture Capital Firms. And um, uh, the, there is a number there <clears throat> that really caught my attention. Uh, and that number is a, is a metric. And basically what they did is compare the total amount of VC investing in the region with the Latin American uh, Producto Interno Bruto, the gross domestic product, okay? And that number is only 3%, okay? Uh, and when you analyze that metric in the U.S. and Europe, uh, I think the numbers are close to 30 percent. The metric is close to 30 percent. So that shows you uh, that the room of, for growth of the industry uh, is huge. And that means lots of investment opportunities for VC funds and angel investors and lots of opportunities um, to, for entrepreneurs that are uh, curious and, and pinpointing the pain points and the opportunities uh, that are, are available in the market, specifically focusing on the needs of the middle class and lower class, uh, because entrepreneurs are given access to this part of the population to products and services that were previously not available, which is basically helping them uh, have a better life and be happy. So, so with that uh, brief uh, preamble, uh, my, my, my guess is that we're beginning, we're going to begin to see a lot of uh, successful entrepreneurs exiting and selling their businesses, which means that the wealth that, that is going to be created uh, 
uh, not only for the co-founders, uh, but also to the early invest investors is going to be huge. And that's where answering your prior question, Silesh, I think uh, from JTC, we can help a lot. Because as, as you explained at the initial part of this meetup, uh, one of our core businesses, be, besides others that, that, that you explained, which is fund administration and corporate services, we're helping high net worth individuals located around the world and the entrepreneurs will be part or are part of this group, uh, set up and implement the correct wealth protection and planning solution, providing trust services, not only from the US, but, for, but from multiple jurisdictions and helping entrepreneurs um, understand that they can protect their wealth and set the rules uh, to make sure that that wealth is transferred to the next generation in an orderly way and a tax efficient way is something very important. And uh, it's a subject that we need uh, as a company and as a group to start talking uh, uh, or expressing or explaining to entrepreneurs because uh, for some reason, most of them either don't have time uh, to uh, listen to these things or they don't understand these things or they have never had access to this type of information. Well, Marcel, thank you. I mean, the great, great irony is, is that the reason why as a business, we are so passionate in this ecosystem, if you like, the Startup Business Angels ecosystem, because JTC itself was started in 1987 as almost a, a startup. Uh, our founder, Nigel Lacane, um, started with a very small uh, trustee business uh, situated above a shop in downtown St. Helier in Jersey. And today we, we're a listed business, uh, um, uh, you know, market cap of around a billion, billion pounds. So, and, and, and 25, 30% of the business still owned by essentially the team and the staff that work work in a business. And of course, then we've got institutional investors who um, have been long-term sort of investors with our business. So we are an example of a startup that, that, yeah. that's come good uh, and, and actually built on that, that advantage. And, and, uh, and, and now sort of, we want to be part of that ecosystem as well. So may I conclude also by thanking um, uh, Bridget and uh, Nick and uh, Marcel for your contribution. Uh, and to our friends at Techni, Techni Summit for organizing and giving us the opportunity to have this workshop. And to our friends at the conference, uh, you know, we'd love to be there. And perhaps next year we will all join you and look forward to meeting you in person. Um, and, and finally, just to say to my good friend, Tariq El Kadi, congratulations on the way you've developed Techni Summit. And, and, and the immense influence that you have and uh, over the, the whole um, Business Angels communities uh, and the growth of, the globally, the growth of uh, the community that's producing new entrepreneurs and new wealth in times when, you know, we may look at economically uh, difficult times, but actually there's a lot brewing, which is, which is uh, positive out there. And, and, and what Techni highlights as a, as a summit is, is the future of um, innovation, of service innovation, and of creating new entrepreneurs and new wealth. And uh, so on that note, I thank everybody. Um, and thanks have a to good you afternoon. for the great moderation. We appreciate it. Oh, nice to you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.